the science falsely so called that is found in verse 20. And let us go ahead and begin tonight with our verse. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. Profane means worldly. Esau was profane. He was not a spiritual man. He was a man that just wanted to eat, get things done. Very practical man. And it's good to be a practical man. It's good to be a manly man, but not if you're going to forget God in the process. And we have a lot of men like that today. Well, there's profane, vain babblings. And they're babblings. That just They don't make any sense. They're worldly. But moving along, there are some things that are opposing the truth in this generation. And it's it calls itself science. But really, it is science falsely so called. It's not real science. And we've been through that in the past weeks on this series concerning psychology. And notice verse 21 says, Which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. And we do pray for the grace of God to be with this church, to, to be with this pastor, to be with all of you. And uh, all of the Christians that are the remnant in these last days that are outside the camp trying to hold fast to the old paths and the old ways, they don't have a globalist mindset. If we have a globalist mindset, it's because we want everybody to be saved or as many people as we can to be saved. And the Lord told us to go out and try to get people saved. But we don't have a new world order mindset. Do you understand that? And uh, this false religion that is... Uh, filled our courtrooms and our public schools and our media and uh, our churches even, God forbid. So we want to take a look at some things here. The title of the message tonight, and listen now, Should We Drug the Squirmy Child? I did not use a medical so-called, it's not really medical, it's just a bunch of nonsense that a bunch of pharmaceutical companies try to con a bunch of people into believing. So they come up with these fancy sounding titles so it sounds professional. And, uh, but you say you don't believe in uh, ADHD? I call it squirmy. It's a squirmy child. That means he can't sit still. He moves all around. And, and let's, let, let's, let's hold to the old paths, all right? Let's, let, let's name the problem for what it is and quit all this nonsense. Uh, if you got a squirmy child, what should you do to him? Well, they say you ought to drug him. And uh, we got here behavior worth medicating. In, 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 in the past uh, weeks, we talked about government and psychiatry joining forces to make children take powerful drugs, even against their parents' wishes. That's the new American, September 17, 2007. And uh, we need to talk about this, I believe, uh, because down the road we're going to get more and more folks that have been uh, deceived or even forced into this type of nonsense. And it needs to be exposed by the preachers of America, and uh, we need to do what we can. Now, listen here. There was a time when the people of God wanted to be like the nations. Do you remember that over there in Samuel, they told Samuel, we don't like the way things are. We don't like how it's been, the old past. We want to be like the nation. And it's very interesting. They wanted a king like the world. But God warned them, if you want to be like the world and copy them, you're going to take away your sons and daughters. And God says, you want to leave the old paths, the old ways of doing things, your children are going to suffer. There comes a time when God's people will not listen to prophets and preachers. His watchmen that are preaching the pure word of God. They want new paths, not the old paths. They want worldly experts. If a preacher gets up, they don't believe that, that, that preachers can be filled with God's Spirit and can preach truth. 
way beyond their academic level to preach. In other words, God, the Bible says these things are spiritually discerned. And if a man will pray and get in the Word of God and study to show himself approved, God will give him what he needs to lead that church in the same way, if he's not a lazy man, in the same way he'll give a father what he needs to lead his home. If he'll get in the book and will hear from God. But there comes a time when people get impressed. They don't want to hear Samuel. They want a king. They want to be like the world. And in these days, they have heaped to themselves teachers, experts, so-called doctors. And they're leaving the simple, the simplicity of the truth for this worldly nonsense that impresses them. And this already happened in the 1950s when they left the preachers and told the preachers, you don't know what you're talking about. We've got experts here. The women were deceived and they began to spock instead of spank. And that led to the 60s rebellion. Well, I'm going to give you experts tonight. The experts that everybody's so impressed with. And I'm going to show you that even among the so-called experts, they don't all agree. There's a lot of them that are starting to agree with the preachers. And when I say preachers, I mean the old past preachers. So as we begin, let's start out with a review here. The devil wants the children of Christian parents. Do you understand that? Francis Xavier, the co-founder of the Jesuits, says, Give me the children until they are seven, and anyone may have them afterwards. That could have came right out of Hillary Clinton's It Takes a Village. See? All these folks, all, all these Democrats are wanting to come out here and take your children from an early age and force them into medical care and psychological care. Republicans are jumping on the bandwagon. I praise God for men like Ron Paul and those that are sounding the alarm to say you need to have your own independent uh, right to decide how you want to raise your children. You need freedom of choice, right? Isn't that what we always hear when they want to kill a baby? Freedom of choice? How about freedom of choice whether I want my squirmy child to be on drugs or not? So the devil wants your children. We know in Exodus 9, I remind you, Moses said we will go with our young and with our old and with our son and with our daughter. And, he, and Pharaoh said unto him, uh, Not so. Go now ye that are men and serve the Lord. That's what the state, the worse it gets, it begins to say, you men go down to your church and do whatever you want to but you're going to put your child in public education for indoctrination and we're going to screen him for medical illnesses, mental illnesses, so-called. When they did the teen screen in Colorado, it's a 10-minute test. 71% of the kids had a so-called mental illness. And they give them movie tickets if they'll take the test. Hamburgers and pizza, movie tickets. You know how Satan seeks to get your children? By parental addiction. The Bible says you ought to addict yourself to the ministry. But once you get addicted to a bunch of worldly trash, worldly videos, worldly books, you want to make sure your children share in your addiction. So you let Satan into your house. And no Bible-believing Christian that understands what the devil's trying to do in these last days, that understands the apostasy of our churches, that understands the rise of the New Age movement and what is happening in the churches today should allow the devil to come into his house. You will be held accountable for that business, you better believe me. For going to this church and, and what we've been preaching for these past years, 
you will be held accountable. And anybody that's heard the truth in these last days, oh, don't you think you'll escape? You allow magic into your house and demonic fairies and trolls. I want you to see how the devil is coming after these children. And the first thing I want you to realize is there are devils. Do you understand that? The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but there are principalities. There are evil spirits. Doctrines of devils. There are things that are occult. And you do not want to allow your children to have contact with the occult. That's how the witch trials began. Oh, she's just a nice slave girl. They just play a few little games, you know. That's how you end up with devil-possessed, or at least devil-afflicted children. So I would say the one thing Christians need to do, if your child's squirmy and crazy and acting, you need to get the occult out of your house. Now that might sound charismatic to you, but I'm going to tell you something. I believe in a real devil. I'm sorry if the liberals don't believe in a devil anymore. I believe in a real devil. And I believe he has spirits, evil spirits. And I believe you have to open yourself up to them for them to afflict you in that way, deceive you. This was the mistake that the World War II generation made, and that mentality is still in our churches today. Because they had been through the Depression and had to go out in the yard and eat curly dock instead of lettuce. Because they'd been through the Depression and World War II and gone through a lot of suffering. When they got out of that suffering and began to build their houses, they said, I don't want my children to experience what I experienced. I want to give them the good things. So they stopped whipping them and they let them just have contact with anything Hollywood wanted. That They just brought Hollywood into their home. It's this pampering thing. It's just addiction in parents that says, I, I, I just feel so bad if my little child didn't have the addictions I had when I grew up. But you fell into sin. Why give it to your children? I just want them to have fun. I just want them to be socialized. I want to send them to school, let them have a... Socialization. That's public indoctrination, isn't it? Others say they need worldly counseling, so they send them to Dr. Dope. You know what? Many Christians are like God's people of old. They feared God. They did a lot of great things for God. They held to a lot of fundamentals of the faith. Oh, but listen now. God continually complained that nevertheless the high places were not removed. I believe there's some high places in Christian homes. Secret high places, too. Oh, I'm a fundamentalist. I just have some high places. Some occult magic. Some fairies. Notice 2 Kings 17. So they feared the Lord. That's good, isn't it? And made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own God. The Bible said one of the chief gods in the last days is going to be the God of pleasure, entertainment. The Bible said in the last days they'll be lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That's one of the chief gods, so-called gods, in these last days. So the people are fearing God, but they go home to the God of entertainment. And they allow occultism into the hearts and minds of their children. They serve their own God after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from them. In other words, you're in the midst of a corrupt country that's corrupting many other nations. I praise God for a lot of our founding beliefs, our Christian heritage uh, uh, somewhat. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of evil in America as well that's being pumped into all the other nations of the world. So you live in the midst of this corrupt nation. God gives His people a warning. It says, don't you learn their ways. Don't you mess with their high places. And one of the things they did on those high places, they took their children up there. And they made their children pass through the fire in the high places. I think there's a lot of that going on today. 
There's a lot of Christians going home. In spite of what they believe, they tell themselves it's all just a joke. The devil is just a joke. Magic is just a joke. But the Bible says fools make a mock at sin. Sin is not funny. Sin is not cute. Magic is not cute. The Bible says in Luke 17, it were better for them that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast him through the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. This is the age of passive parenting. I heard a roll-off sermon the other day. He said he couldn't believe, even back in his day, how children are left to themselves. I believe if you're going to go out here and buy a dog, you ought to take care of your dog. And I believe if you're going to bring a child into this world, it's your responsibility to take care of that child. And Roloff was saying, he could not believe how children were left to themselves. We've got passive parenting. They don't read ingredients and they stick anything into a child's physical body. And there's ingredients right there that you could read. It doesn't matter. Passivity. And not only are they passive when it comes to their child's immune system, they trash the child's mind with spiritual poison. And evil communications corrupt good manner. And here's the problem. When you're in a body, you have a responsibility. Don't you tell me that what you do in your house is just your business. That is true to some degree, but what you do in your house is going to affect the local body here in Kingdom Baptist Church. Because we've come out from among them and want to be separate from the world. And you never, I'm going to tell you this right now, you, my, my child is almost eight years old, i got four dollars, daughters, I'm going to tell you, never will you have to worry about one of your, your children being corrupted because my little girl is telling your child about some wicked cartoon some wicked superhero so-called, some type of magic this or magic that. It's not going to happen in my house. As long as God's grace is upon me. As long as I'm breathing. And I expect the same thing from you. I expect when you bring your children here to Kingdom Baptist Church and you let them interact with all these other children, I expect when you go home, you're going to be clean. So you say, what's the first thing I should do about a wiggly child? A squirmy, wiggly child. Make sure devils don't have contact with your child. That might sound ridiculous, preaching against uh, hyperactive children to start with devils. But I'm going to start there. Remove your child from contact with evil spirits. You know what they say about Harry Potter? It's just fun. That's what they say about all magic, don't they? It's just fun. Well, I tell you what, when those Christians got saved, when those people got saved, became Christians in the book of Acts, they took all their magic books and they burned them. And if they were in the last days of the day, they'd take their magic videos and they would burn them. A lot of money. A lot of money. You know what? They burned them publicly just to show what they thought about it. But you know what? There's some entertainment out there that might be neutral, apparently. There might be some books, I know there are, that are neutral. I'd say this, though. The Bible teaches you ought to have your senses exercised by reason of use so you can discern good and evil. I'm going to tell you, most of what parents think is neutral is poison and corrupted. And you are blinded in your eyes. There is a covering over your eyes. You are blinded by your own will to have fun with your child, just like they were blinded in the 1950s. 
So 80% of what you think is neutral for your child is not neutral. It's corrupt from hell. But you say, well, what about those things that are neutral? Let me tell you something here tonight. Ecclesiastes 7 says, Neither make thyself overwise. Why shouldst thou destroy thyself? I say, what do you mean by that, preacher? Do you know you only have so much time? You've only got a certain window of time to do something with your children and ensure that when they leave, they fear God, love God, and want to stick close to God? The Bible says in 2 Timothy that in the last days, they're going to be ever learning but never able to come to knowledge of the truth. This is what overwise means. You know everything about everything. The ostrich, the kangaroo in Australia, you know everything about everything, but you don't fear the Lord. This is why parents are losing their children. They give them every type of lesson in the world, every type of library book, every type of this, every type of that. And what do children believe? Well, my mom told me, my daddy showed me that the main thing is not really important because it was never the central part of it. Oh, we went to church. But God really did not have possession of my life. We weren't sold out for God. This is why I suggest to you, I don't believe that you need to be slack in regard to academics, but we need to go back to making learning holy. Webster's Dictionary, read that. Uh, these men understood how to make learning holy. They mixed religion and Christianity. You say, we can't do that because of public school. We're not in public school. The Bible said, train up your child in the way he should go. There's only so much energy, so much time to read, so much time for you to instill God into the hearts of your children. And these children are not being strengthened into the centrality of Jesus. I believe education and I believe fun can be spiritual, holy. I believe you can invite God into these things. My children don't get excited about television. My children are not excited about the next movie. My children are not excited about the next DVD. They've never seen any of these things. What my children get excited about is stories. I can control stories that I make up. And they beg me, can we have another story? And when I tell them one, they run and go tell the other children stories. And every one of them has something to do with God or some type of moral basis. They don't know. They're being denied something that this world has. They have fun. You can let your children have fun and teach them holiness and holy principles, and virtues, and godly things. And not making a joke out of religion. What does this have to do with squirmy children? John W. Tranter in 1986, wrote the book Images, and he said this, Many reports confirm that television violence is linked to aggressive behavior in children. Time, 1982. He says, We usually think a TV is a pacifier or babysitter. That's really why most parents sit their child in front of this thing. They can't make them stay still any other way. They don't have any authority to say, Go sit down and read a book. The child would get up and say no and throw the book all over the place. So they have to put them before the television drug, the video drug. But TV is not a pacifier. Campaigns financed with millions of dollars seek to change your child's behavior. These violent cartoons. Everything's violent. And children are sitting down 
watching these things. No wonder they leave and they want to hit things and break things and hit somebody. Kick something. I'm talking to Christians in your entertainment. What in the world is going on out here in the world? What type of violence are they watching? I don't want to know. Please don't tell me. I'll get sick to my stomach. I can only take so much. So I believe there's a lot of children that are mimicking cartoon or video violence Let's go into the third thing. First thing is remove occultism from your child. All magic. All evil. Second thing is spend more time with holy, wholesome things that, 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 that anchor your child in the things of God. And beware of the moral content of what you think are wholesome DVDs and videos. Let's move on to the third thing. And oh, this is important too. Older folks didn't have problems with squirmy children as much. They said, well, much of this thing has to do with discipline. There's a time to run, time to jump, time to yell. And when children don't have yards, no wonder they're going crazy. They used to have trees and yards and places to go. But in our society today, we don't have it. So you need to get down in the park. You need to, to, to go places where your child can run. Praise God for our church. Amen. Our church property. Praise God, you can get out of here and run and yell and have fun. I believe children need that and praise God for it. But there's a time to settle down. And when there's a time to settle down, you need to control yourself, sit still, and be quiet. And a parent ought to have the authority, but you know what? Parents can't make a dog sit still. You ought to be able to take your dog, just like my wife could take my dog, and say, sit. And the dog sit. And to put a Thing of meat before its face and say, don't move. And then say, okay, get it. Then, you, then the dog gets up and gets it. Your child ought to be the same way. God forbid a child is more intelligent than a dog. You ought to be able to set your child down and say, sit and don't move. Don't say a word. And sit over there and talk to your husband or talk to your wife. And your child ought to just sit there and not say a word. It's just control. We don't have control over children today. That's the problem. Nobody has that de facto authority to be able to say, sit, hush, don't say anything. But God says you ought to rule your home. Mama ought to be able to look at her child and say, sit down over there, don't say a word. The child ought to obey. Not kick, not say, uh, 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 not do anything. It ought to sit down and be, or you're not training your child. You're leaving the child to itself. It's not really a child problem. Hyperactive children is not really a child problem in these last days. It's a parent problem. The parents aren't there. And if they are there, they're not doing the job to bring your child under submission. Childs are down at public school. The problem with public school, there's many problems. One of the main problems, they don't have a stick down there anymore. They used to have principals that walked around in long overcoats and had big paddles. Don't you tell me they didn't have them. Son, when you went to a principal's office, you grabbed a hold of the desk and you bent over and you tried to be a man and not cry. But after he knocked you about five times, friend, there's tears coming out your eyes. In first grade, I remember. My wife gets angry, but there's a little girl named Sally. And I remember in first grade, smiling at this little blonde-haired girl named Sally. And she smiled back. I had a big, black woman teacher. And back then, in first grade, they walk over with a ruler. She tore my knuckles up like you've never seen. And after she tore my knuckles up with that ruler, I got over my corner and I read so much, I went out of first grade and skipped second and went on to third grade. It's the absolute truth. Or my knuckles up, buddy. I started reading. 
See, we don't have control. She knew how to deal with hyper children, squirmy little children. And if school doesn't have the power to make the children sit still, you're a fool to send your child down there. So they can get trained every day to squirm around. So we've rejected the rod because it's somehow abuse. And we've got such a deranged society, they're going to replace the rod with drugs. Dope. Isn't that nice? So they can go shoot people and commit suicide and have all types of mental problems. Physical problems. You know, it takes time and effort to train your children. Y'all listening tonight? It takes time. You have to be there. The AP in 2006, February 28th, said, Study links child care to problem behavior. We know this. Preacher has been saying it for years. I just want to quote a few experts tonight to show... Child care linked to problem behavior. According to a new study by the National Institute of Health, the more time children spend in child care, the more likely their sixth grade teachers were to report problem behaviors. Why is that? Proverbs 29, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. The child care daycare center does not have the ability or the time or even the love to discipline those children the way they need to be disciplined. Therefore, children are entering the sixth grade right out of daycare, never learning the wonderful ability to control yourself. But do you think society wants to repent of its feminism, repent of its daycare, go back to strengthening the family and the marriage and and, and bringing back the rod and Christian values? It'll solve the hyperactivity problem in America. No. No. They want to go further into the New World Order and the brave New World and put the child on dope. Worse than cocaine. Drugs that used to be illegal by the government are now fed daily to millions of children. Child left to himself brings his mama to shame. Never leave a child to its own self-will. What else now? They're removing distractions down in South Carolina. They're, they're taking girls and boys and splitting them up. They're saying, you know, distraction is a big problem. And that's, that's true. Now, at least they're fixing it a little bit, but that's not really the answer, see? That's just putting a Band-Aid on a cancer. I mean, you need to do something else. But what about a very common sense answer. We've seen evil spirits and occultism. We've seen um, discipline. We've seen spending more time with God in godly books. Make up your own story. If you ain't got the energy and you're too lazy to, to come ask me where to get godly stories, if you don't want to do that, then sit down and make up your own. Your child will love it. It might be the silliest story in the world. They love it. Just because you're spending time telling them a story. And you can ensure that you tell them a godly story. But let me show you something else that is very much a common sense thing, but you have to take time to think about it. Once a child gets addicted to only being still when he sees video flash, what do you think happens to the child every other moment? He has to be hypnotized. He only knows to sit still with video flash and excitement. But everything else, reality is too boring. It doesn't have the colors. It doesn't have the sound. It doesn't have the activity. I mean, life is boring. So they have to walk around and shake their head and look like they're devil-possessed. They're seeing those images in their head. They're trying to duplicate it so they can get that 
that, that thrill of excitement. This is why I've rejected the whole thing for eight years of child training. I'm not going to tell you i got the best children in the world. They're best to me. I love them. But they can say the books of the Bible. They're working on them backwards. They can memorize things. They seem to be doing well. I'm pleased with their academic ability. I'm pleased with their spiritual understanding. I wouldn't trade it. You say, would you go back now and do it different? You, not, absolutely not. Not after the fruit I've seen. I believe with all my heart that children ought to be kept from videos and that type of stimulation. Absolutely believe it. I believed it before I had children. I still believe it now. I'm not going to judge you if you want to. Uh, but I am going to give you a warning tonight. I'm going to give you some warning. That's what a preacher ought to do. Because I want your children to be the best. I don't want you to miss that opportunity that you have to pull back that bow and let go of that arrow. You say, Preacher, why didn't you tell me this back then? When you're dealing with problems now that your child has grown. And you're like, I thought they were going to turn out to be more spiritual, but they just, what, what did I do wrong, Preacher? I want to warn you now while you have the opportunity. God ordained that His Word be preserved in a book. I think he did it for a reason. If God wanted to preserve a video, he would have done it. But he did not. To me, that's, that, that's the best argument of all. There's something about reading that is important. Now, they've proven that when a child goes the video route, his ability to read and write decreases. So anything that takes away the ability of my child to read this book is evil to me. Children can no longer distinguish well between reality and imagery. I do not believe a child's brain and mind were designed by God to handle the amount of visual stimulation that they've been given today through DVDs and videos. And any book you give your child has got to have so many ridiculous pictures in them. You look back in the older days, they had a few little line drawings. And children were fascinated with those. They were amazed and entertained. But now you have to have these perverted looking faces. These, these, it's just a, ridiculous. Half the stuff that's out there today, when they even draw Bible characters, they draw them so perverted, it's hippie art. It's marijuana art. Marijuana art has entered into the churches in children's books. You didn't have marijuana art when you look at the McGuffey readers and see kids skipping and having fun and playing with apple pie and skating on the left. You didn't have marijuana art. Tech World News. Of all people, Tech World News. Tech News World. How about that? Tells us Molly Mann, Molly Mann, adjunct clinical assistant professor of psychiatry. And you, you don't believe Roloff. You don't believe preachers. So we're going to give you experts tonight, all right? I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching out there, okay? You're my friend. Adjunct clinical assistant professor of psychiatry and behavioral science at Stanford University of Medicine says that, quote, their brains get used to too much auditory and visual stimulation, and in the absence of these stimulations, they do not know what to do with themselves. Common sense. You train your child to sit still by doping them up with TV, then what are you going to do when the TV's not there? You ever thought about that? They get anxious, restless, bored, aggressive. So you know the problem with classrooms today? 
Well, my teachers cannot keep them still. There's a lot of reasons. They don't have the authority to keep them still. But one of the main reasons is there's no visual stimulus. If they showed them a movie, they'd be totally still. If it had enough flash in it. But you've got kids sitting there looking at books. They've never seen a book. The words aren't dancing around on the page. You want me to look at black and white letters? No wonder the kids go crazy. They get anxious, restless, bored, and aggressive. Some reports have condemned the use of computers in schools. Constant media exposure is an example, is an experience that will reduce self-control in children. They've shown this to be the case. The American Academy of Pediatrics maintains that children under age two should not be exposed to television. And whatever they do, you need to pump it up. See, when the world says something's PG, then it's probably X. And the world says nobody under two should watch the television, regardless of the content. Then you need to pump it on up to like 12. I don't believe adults ought to be watching most of the trash that's out there. Ironically, medical experts said parents with the highest educational goals and aspirations for their children and the resources to make choices to reach these goals are the ones who typically flood their children with every type of media from educational videos to the latest in computer technology. I rejected that route, see, in the education of my little girl. I said, look, it doesn't take long to learn how to type. It doesn't take long to learn how to use a computer. Folks that are 70 years old learn how to do it pretty quick. So I want to ensure that they have proper literary education before they start messing around with that nonsense. See. I think there could be some value in learning how to use a keyboard board and a mouse, but not right now. See. In doing so, Leah Klungness, Ph.D., said these parents ignore common sense and practical experience and actually deprive their children of the very experiences that allow them to master the sort of self-control that leads to academic success. Too much technology exposure can lead to inattentiveness in the classroom setting for school-age children. They may get diagnosed incorrectly with uh, attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or even be erroneously labeled bipolar disorder. They're saying this is pretty much common sense. When your child learns all this computer stuff and they bring these computers into the classroom, they said, oh, we're going to get some smart children now. No, it goes down. What's the deal? During this precious time, the child needs to learn his letters. He needs to learn to write cursive and to read. He needs to learn to be able to write his thoughts down on paper in a meaningful fashion and to be able to read and comprehend what he's reading. You don't want to interrupt that. Not during these delicate years when they're being trained and developing habits for the whole rest of their life. Lacey, and, and we've been preaching this stuff for years, uh, back in 1999, he put an article in the Kingdom Alert, Brother Lacey Evans, TV and ADD, The Connection Exposed, as a school teacher, he says attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This faddish mental disorder seems to be taking the country by storm. Parents who once trampled one another trying to be the first one in line for Beatles tickets are now standing in line to have their children diagnosed as ADHD. Our changing television viewing habit over the past few years could perhaps be a causal factor in the outbreak of behavioral symptoms that so often are attributed to ADD. I remember as a child coming upon a nest of hatching sparrows. I wanted so much to help the poor struggling baby birds crack out of their eggs. My father stopped me explaining that unless the birds faced the struggle of freeing themselves from the eggs, they would not survive. A vital part of the hatchling's physical development occurs during the intense effort involved in breaking out. If your child's having trouble sitting down and reading, it's just boring. Well, you, get in the, you keep going at it. You keep struggling. You sit down and you sit down and read. And before long, they're not going to have any trouble doing it, see.
The early struggles of childhood's formative years are equally vital to the development of the human hatchling. Jane Healy, in her book, Endangered Mind, states that some physicians, parents, and teachers are too eager to give children drugs, variations of the stimulants or amphetamines, banned and over-the-counter diet pills, with well-recognized side effects, instead of working to help them learn to manage their own behavior. Some studies have shown that the level of riddle and dosage needed to make teachers approve a child's behavior is so high that it actually dulls reasoning ability. Lauren Axelrod, in Director of Media Arts, Episcopal High School, Houston, Texas. Axelrod, in an article published in the Educational Digest, October 95, she describes a phenomenon that she calls the drone zone. This drone zone is entered by the child when he is placed in front of the television, either by his parents or by himself, in order to zone out or disconnect himself from the world around him. She points out an all too familiar scenario, that of a parent using the TV to make her children go limp, to render them more manageable. This is an observation she has made repeatedly in interviewing many parents at parent-teacher workshops she conducts concerning media awareness. Ultimately, the children begin to utilize this purpose for TV in the same way they have been inadvertently taught. TV becomes a kind of drug which encourages inactivity. This pattern of unconscious TV use is potentially damaging to school performance. Axelrod describes her experiences as a teacher with students who exhibit a wide range of behavioral problems. These problems, which she relates to the ill use of TV viewing, include young children struggling with simple concentration tasks, rapid edit thought processing in middle schoolers that inhibits their ability to think through a problem, and impaired critical thinking skills in high schoolers. Sound familiar? Jane Healy offers some possible scientific reasons for this observed phenomena of zombie-like behavior. One, the brain is artificially manipulated by TV into paying attention by violating certain of its natural defenses, which frequent visual and auditory changes known as saliency. I believe what this is saying is this. Your design, if somebody walks up to you and something's coming at you a million miles an hour, you're designed to move, see. You're designed to react. Well, after a while on TV, you get so used to it that it just deadens it. See. And now, going through daily life when nothing's jumping out at you or jumping in your face, you can't pay attention. 